Vince began by tipping his hat to Margaret Thatcher. So let me, let me begin by sweeping off my hat, metaphorically, to uh, the great Whig thinker, poet, uh, historian, and Indian administrator, Lord Macaulay, who in 1824 said the following, free trade, one of the greatest blessings that a government can bestow upon a people is in almost every country unpopular. True then, true now. Which is odd when you think about it, because the intervening 200 years have seen an unprecedented improvement in the human condition. By any metric you like, literacy, longevity, female education, calorie intake, largely because of the spread of specialization and exchange through the process that we loosely call globalization. And yet it keeps running up against our prejudices, against our intuitions. Or to flip it around, the mercantilist case, the protectionist case, the anti-trade case, rests on a series of assertions that are utterly specious but that sound completely plausible, that all sound like common sense. We can't carry on with a big trade deficit without going bankrupt. We can't compete with slave wage economies. We have to protect our strategic industries. We should grow more of our own food. These lines are literal claptrap. They will bring an audience into applause. And yet almost every one of them, almost every time it's been applied, has served to make a country needlessly poorer. So what's the problem, and why uh, are, we, are we wrestling with it now? Well, part of the problem is simply a psychological one. When I said free trade is counterintuitive, I meant that in the most literal way. We have the instinct and intuitions of hunter-gatherers. For example, we have an instinct to want to hoard food so as to get through the winter, right? Very good, solid instinct to have on the savannas of Pleistocene Africa. Not such a useful instinct in a world of superabundance and skyscrapers. We are, if you like, maladapted to an economic system where we depend on people we haven't yet met to give us stuff we haven't yet seen. But that is the basis of our prosperity. So uh, whenever somebody says, oh, isn't it terribly worrying that you know, we don't grow all of our own wheat? You know, we import 42% of our food in this country. Yeah, you know what? We've been doing that since the early 18th century. And you know what? We've got quite a lot richer since the early 18th century. Show me a country that concentrates on food production and I'll show you somewhere like Guatemala. I mean, no, nothing against Guatemala. I work part of the year in Guatemala, but that is not where you want to stay. You want to be moving up the production chain. That is always a counterintuitive difficult point, as we've seen uh, during the Australia and New Zealand trade talks. You also have what I can only call an aesthetic objection to it. You know, isn't it awful that all these poor women in Vietnam are stitching sneakers together for 50p a day, uh, exploited by horrible Western companies? Well, of course, you wouldn't want to work in a, in a sweatshop in Hanoi, and neither would I. But let's not deny agency to the people involved. Consider that they might have made rational choices. Your alternative, and mine, was not breaking your back in a paddy field all day. Uh, the employee of a foreign-owned company in Vietnam earns roughly twice as much as the average in that country. So uh, the, the, the process of industrialization and globalization can be physically unattractive, but it is a process with an exit route. And at the end, you end up better. Indeed, in the process, you end up better off. I think it was the, it was the great Victorian uh, novelist, Anthony Trollope, who said, poverty, to be scenic, should be rural. And a great deal of our development and international aid policy rests on this fundamentally aesthetic distaste for the process of globalization. And then, of course, we have the straightforward political uh, uh, objection, which I can summarize in four words. Free trade brings dispersed gains, concentrated losses. When Donald Trump uh, uh, applied steel tariffs, or when Biden kept them, they, they were, without question, doing net damage to the United States economy. They were pushing up prices, they were damaging all the downstream industries that used steel, but those costs uh, were dispersed, and the gains in this case, however slight for the, uh, for the steel producers, 
were the kind of games that people will switch their vote on. Uh, US sugar is twice the cost of global sugar. Sugar has been pretty much since the revolution. Why? Fundamentally because Florida is a key swing state and both parties are to a degree in hoc to the producers there. But it does mean, well, there's, there's a reason, right, why American chocolate doesn't taste very nice. It's because they, they, they're using corn syrup instead of sugar. And more to the point, they've driven confectioners to Canada and uh, to Mexico, right? So, so all of these things uh, explain in general terms why 200 years on, despite all of the miracles, we still don't get it. Here's my worry. Things have got a lot worse over the past 18 months. In February of last year, in probably the only hall in the country that would have been as suited to the subject as this one, the Prime Minister stood up uh, at the, uh, the, the Maritime Museum in Greenwich and made the best speech on liberalization and free commerce that I've ever heard from a contemporary senior politician. And the wrecking ball that came in after that, to use Vince's metaphor, was not Donald Trump or, or Biden, it was, of course, the epidemic and the associated lockdowns, which have served to throw people back even more on these Paleolithic heuristics, have served to make us even more protectionist, introverted, wary, and uh, frightened of change. The number of, of previously reliable free marketeers who have said to me at some point in the last 18 months, things like, well, surely, Hannon, even you, after this coronavirus, even you can see why we need to grow our own food in this country. Seriously? Seriously, that, that's, that's what you got from what we've just been through? And the one thing that works beauty, I, I, I'd have thought this scrambling for vaccine would have at least removed the stigma from the idea of imports, right? But it doesn't seem to have had that effect at all because we're all still thinking with our cavemen minds and reasoning backwards from our conclusions. The, the lockdowns hit last year during the period that our farmers called the hungry gap, when we don't really grow any food. Had we not been able to import what we wanted from around the world, we would have been living on rhubarb and asparagus. That's what we grow uh, in late March and April. Maybe a bit of nettle soup and possibly some purple sprouting broccoli. Like, fortunately, Global markets worked really well, and that reminds us of a counterintuitive but actually fairly indisputable point, which is that if you want security, whether it's in food or in PPE or in ingredients for vaccines or anything else, the way to be secure is to source whatever it is you need from as wide a variety of suppliers as possible, from a diverse global group of suppliers so that you are not vulnerable to a localized shock or disruption. And that localized shock or disruption can as easily happen in your own territory as anywhere else, which is why self-sufficiency doesn't make you secure. If you doubt me, consider the most self-sufficient country in the world, the country that has elevated self-sufficiency to its ruling principle. North Korea, they call it Juche, import substitution is what they do the last place on the planet where you still have man-made famines. Other end of that scale, Singapore. Doesn't produce a single edible ounce. Totally dependent on imports for food, for drinking water, electricity. Where would you rather live, ladies and gentlemen? The reality is that you end up not only with cheaper produce, but with better and safer produce in a globalized world. My concern is that all of this has been knocked off course. But I'll finish where I began with Macaulay's observation from the 1820s. It was unpopular then, and it has been unpopular at every intervening stage, and yet, periodically, it happens. And the countries that do it, Hong Kong or Singapore in the late 20th century, Australia or New Zealand more recently, and now, as I hope, Britain, the countries that do it don't look back. Once you have removed the vested interests and allowed living standards to rise, people can see the benefits to everyone, but especially to those previously on the lowest incomes. So my hope is that we will take this unfrozen moment as the impact of the lockdown recedes and reassert ourselves as a global free trader, because if we don't, it's not going to come around a second time.